Entrevistas Alfa. Hello, Sir Peter. How are you? I'm very good, Christina. How are you? Fine, thank you. Very excited because the world's going to see you really soon, like the treasure, this incredible treasure that you had in your hands, uh, being the first person in 50 years to watch this. And how was it to you when you when you went, I don't know, maybe home or to the studio and saw this this material for the first time? Well, I mean, it's two things, really. I mean, I, I I watched it with the knowledge. I mean, as a Beatles fan, I'd read books for 40 years. And I the, all the books have said that this period of their career, the get back, you know, you know project which became uh, Let, Let It Be eventually, is like they were breaking up. They were miserable. It was terrible. They hated being doing it. And the cameras were filming them. And and so I had read all this. And I, I mean, if that was a truth, I, I wouldn't have made this film because I didn't want to make a film about the Beatles being miserable, but um, I, I needed to see it, obviously, because no one had seen it in 50 years. But So I was sort of dreading it a little bit uh, when I started to watch it, but then that's not the reality. The re that's, that's completely wrong because they were they did break up in, in, in April 1970. In May 1970, Let It Be and uh, the movie and the film come out. But, um, but, that, but the, the filming took place 15 months earlier. So I'm not looking at... at, at, at um, at April 1970, I'm looking at January 1969, and I'm thinking, well, of course, this is not, they're not breaking up. What, what, why have all these books said this? They're describing, you know, the, the final product. They're not describing the actual time it was being shot. And I started to watch it, and it was so funny. And, and then it was also, then, then you click into that mode of um, this is a, a, a unbelievable Beatles footage. As a fan, I've, you know, obviously, as you know, seen all the documentaries and you, and, and, you know, some documentaries are great, some are not so good, but you sort of get the feeling you've seen the same footage all the time. You know, Shea Stadium clip, Ed Sullivan, this, oh, yeah, this press conference, oh, yeah, that's, that's the, um, the um, Memphis press conference at 66. You, you know, I know that one. You know, there's a, there's a limited amount of Beatles footage, Hard Day's Night clip. Um, and suddenly I'm looking at, I'm looking at dozens of hours of Beatles footage that no one has ever seen. You know, the, these guys shot it and they put it on on on, a, on in a vault and didn't want anyone to see it. And for 50 years, it sat there. And I'm, and I'm looking at the most unbelievable Beatles footage I've ever seen in my life as a fan. Unbelievable. There's nothing better than this footage. It's it's intimate. It's personal. It's it's so it 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 it, it makes it's the human beings. The, it's these four. It's John Paul Jordan Ringo, almost not the Beatles. It's John Paul Jordan Ringo as people. And you and and I, I'm thinking this is unbelievable footage. So. So then, so at that point, the excitement um, kicked in, yeah. As you're saying, we're used to, I mean, uh, as the fans to watch that material, that videos, just just as fans, you know, just watch them and being outside and far. But with this project and with your work, we feel like witness, like we are there witnessing everything in the studio by their side. Uh, can you recall any moment or scene, specific scene that made you say, yes, I want to do this? No, it wasn't really like that because, it, I mean, Michael Lindsay Hogg shot the footage and he shot it for 22 days, over 22 days as they were doing this project. And I wanted to, I didn't want to, want to, you know, commit to doing it till I'd watched it all because I wanted to make sure, I wanted to know exactly what the footage was before I agreed to make the movie. And, and it, it's really the, it's the, it's the friendship that affected me. It's the fact that these guys clearly love love each other. And that is not a moment. It's not a one. It it's just comes across as a sort of energy and a, a vibe throughout it. And you come away thinking, God, these what these guys are, they're really great guys. They're nice guys. And they have so much affection for each other. And it's just the, it's that it's that feeling that that has you know emotionally affected affected me the most. And okay. if, if, you know, but they also we, we you know they end up going up onto the rooftop of Savile Row for the concert, and I'd seen you know bits of the concert in various documentaries, but this is I I, I watched all the rushes of the concert, you know, you know, forty five minutes, ten cameras. And I just thought, God, the whole concert is ten times better than anything I've ever seen the, when I see one or two songs from the rooftop. Seeing the whole thing is just so much better than watching bits and pieces. So, you know, one of the first things I said to Apple after I watched it, I said, look, we'll figure out what, how to tell the story. But I said, the one thing we've got to do, we've got to put the entire rooftop co concert on. And they said, really? And he, even Paul McCartney wasn't so sure. He said, I don't know whether people really want to, we, we, we really want to see all, all of it. And I said, yeah, yeah. And then, I, you know, I, we, we edited the rooftop 
And and when Paul saw it, he wrote to me and said, "No, you, you're completely right. It was it was pretty great seeing it, seeing it in its entirety." He, he said, "I didn't I didn't think that it, w- it would work, but it's fantastic." He he was excited. So yeah. <laughs> this next question is kind of hard, but it has to do now that you mentioned the concert in the rooftop. So uh, this was amazing. This was amazing. The cameras, the editing, the treatment of the colors. Uh, for example, the red jacket of Ringo that looks amazing. So if you had a pick. Any process of all of this uh, project, who would you? What would you say was the most challenging? The one you said, "Oh my God, this is hard, and we should put more attention to this." Uh, well, yeah, it was it was the sound actually. It wasn't the picture. You know, there's ways with digital technology you can restore film, and, and we didn't do anything to the colors. We didn't we didn't do anything to the colors. Th- those are the 1969 colors that were captured on film in 1969. We just Restored it, sharpened it, and that's what they—that's what they were. We didn't—we didn't enhance those colors. Um, fantastic, fantastic clothes they wear. Fantastic clothing. Uh, no, but it was the sound because what we we had a problem with the sound because a lot of the um, the time that they're doing this project, they're not really in a recording studio. For some of it, they are. The second half, they're in a studio, and they and there's a lot of eight track, you know, proper studio tape when they're performing that we're able to use that. But a lot of it is rehearsing. And when they're rehearsing, they're not they're not rolling the expensive eight track tape. They're just rehearsing. And they're not in recordings. But the film crew are filming them, so they're recording it on these quarter inch um, mono tapes. So it's all mono, it's not mixed. You know, the vocals are too are too low, the guitars are drowning out, because that's yeah, just it's a rehearsal. And and when they're talking, there's conversations that somebody have that you're trying to hear, and somebody's strumming a guitar, and you can't hear what they're saying. So it's very frustrating. So what we did is we developed a, a computer technology using artificial intelligence, machine learning. We could we we we, we developed software that we could teach the computer what a human voice sounded like, what a guitar sounds like, what a drum sounds like, what a bass sounds like. So we could take this mono tape, feed it into the computer, and say, you know, just give us one track with the drums. And so you'd see them singing and you see them playing the guitar. You can't hear the scene. You can't hear the, And you see Ringo playing. It's great. He's the, only the drums. And then the, the, and we could get the vocals by themselves. We could get all the things separate. So we could actually mix and balance this. And the, what the advantage with that was is that the those conversations they're having, where they're talking and there's loud guitar, you know, you can't hear them. We got rid of the guitars and all these private conversations we can hear them loud and clear for the first time they in 50 years the, the you know what they're saying to each other was was um very clear and a lot in, in the final get back a, a lot of the story is being told through them their conversations which used to be drowned out by guitars but we've got really guitars now and the, and they're telling their own story and it's very personal that they don't realize they're being you know their conversations are 50 years later going to be as clear clear as they as we've made them. And so um, it's pretty, pretty you, they're saying stuff that they didn't ever want anyone to hear. And it's in there. So it's like, you know, it's very, very, in, very, very intimate. Wow. Well, definitely the wait was worth it because you did an amazing job with all this uh, treasure uh, of the Beatles to us, the fans. Thank you very much for your time, Sir Peter. Um, just a final message. Do you have something to say to your Mexican fans? Hi everybody in Mexico. I, I've I've never been there, and I, and and I really it's on my list. I, w- I won't say bucket list because that's a bit depressing. It's on my it's on my happy list to come to Mexico. It looks like it's a fantastic place. It, you know, every, <laughs> Thank you. you see it, it's incredible. Thank you and congratulations for your work. Bye. Entrevistas Alpha.